Here we go. I'm going to go ahead and record to the cloud. Uh, I'll just give a lot of different behind the scenes tips. So one of the things, if any of you record Zoom meetings, uh, one of the issues that comes up sometimes with Zoom meetings is latency, which is a delay in your audio. So if you do any post-production stuff, one way to get your audio to sync is, um, if you remember like Hollywood, they say take one and they clap. Um, so that clapper board that they do is actually meant to help you sync the audio. So I'm just going to do that quickly. That'll help me when I, in post-production, I'll line up that snap sound or the clap sound with my hands coming together. Um, but if any of you notice when you record your Zoom sessions and the audio is off, your mouths are moving, but it doesn't match what you're saying. If you go to iMovie or any other free software, you can actually, um, the command in, in that video editing is detach audio. And you basically remove the audio clip as a separate thing that you can slide back and forth and you can line it up. And it's a lot easier to do it if you have a clap or something to sync it to than to try to match um, your, your lips to the, and you're talking. If you're like me and you forget to do the clap at times, uh, one other pro tip is hard consonant sounds like P's and B's, any words. Like if someone says, welcome to problem-based learning, um, you can usually sync it up to the P sound or something like that. Um, you can tell I've done a lot of audio synchronization in here. So that's not what we're talking about tonight, but occasionally these things will come out. So uh, first of all, let me just introduce myself. So my name is Mike Flynn. Uh, I'm from Mount Holyoke College. And um, for a good number of years, I've been working in remote learning way before pandemic. And um, my hope is actually to be working with you all and, uh, and help you navigate some of the challenges as they come up for you uh, in remote learning. And so tonight, what we're going to do in these very brief 30-minute sessions is we're going to tackle some challenges with hybrid learning. I've been getting a lot of requests for tips and uh, ideas about how do you, how do you teach uh, some kids who are in class and some kids who are online at the same time and do that well. Well, uh, if you don't know about my work at Mount Holyoke College, um, so way back in 2013, we designed uh, what I call the dynamic hybrid learning model. So this is right when Zoom started, we've been working with this idea of teaching people who are in person and online at the same time. And it's not easy. I'll just say right out of the gate, if some of you are looking for like, what's the quick and easy way to do that? There is no quick and easy way. I, I will be honest and say that hybrid learning is, it's hard at first. It's very natural to me now, but I can tell you that the first year we did it, it was, it was tricky at first. And part of the reason was, and this is going to be some good advice for you, is we were not really good at forgiving ourselves. We, the, my, it was both mostly me teaching the hybrid the first year. Um, and, and so I should say I wasn't good at forgiving myself. I set really high standards for what the experience was going to be like. And any tech glitch, I, it just wrecked me. It like, I got so overwhelmed with anything that didn't work. And if I had a plan of like, I think this is how um, breakout groups are going to go and it doesn't go that way. Um, I, I was getting really frustrated. And the biggest lesson I learned was let all that stuff go. Um, it's not going to be as good as you want it to be. And as soon as I came to peace with that, honestly, everything changed at that point. It became a lot easier because I realized that we're all, my students and myself and my colleagues, we're all learners in this. And so um, it doesn't, I, I want to help people realize that if you, if you sort of set your expectations down a little bit to be a learner in it and to, and to actually work with your students in that model, uh, having them help you decide, is the microphone good there? Or is it not loud enough? And, um, and maybe in the classroom, you'll see in a bit when we talk about some of the technology in the classroom, having a student handle some of that um, is, is a really helpful thing. Um, it depending on the age of your kids. Uh, I, I would give even second graders uh, access to like the iPad to move it and, and do the camera angles. And so I'm getting a little ahead of myself with the technology piece, but uh, I just want to say right out of the gate, uh, take a deep breath and, and, and practice self-forgiveness with this model. It is difficult, but it is also doable once you stop trying to make it a perfect production. That was my biggest mistake is I wanted it to be perfect and it's not going to be. And once you realize that, 
then you can just be in the moment and focus on the teaching and learning. So, so let's talk a little bit about dynamic hybrid learning and just like, what does it mean? So for me, um, if, if, by the way, if you haven't seen a session with me yet, you'll notice that the way I present is I have slides that are, um, I do a picture in picture here. So the slides will show up, but if you're in gallery view, it's going to be really hard to see. So uh, I would prefer if you all could just go to speaker view, you'll be able to see it. I could spotlight my video and make it something that everyone sees, but it, um, it just, it's one more thing to think about. So um, I'll let you all decide. So you can either uh, go ahead to speaker view and while I'm talking, you'll see the slides nice and big. You also could hover your cursor over my video and there'll be three dots that show up. You can click on that and then hit pin video if you wanna make that the large thing. It'll make it easier to see the slides here. But the basic ingredients, so when we think about hybrid learning, basically you've got, I call them like this on campus because I teach at a college, but like in-class students and online students. And then you have the facilitator or the teacher who's sort of the bridge between those two. Now, the way that we connect it, all you need for hybrid learning, forget all the other fancy technology, uh, all you really need is a computer. Like, and, and so instead of overwhelming yourself thinking about cameras and microphones and all these things right now, at the very basic level, you need a, a computer that allows you to see and hear your online students and allows your online students to see and hear you. That's, that's it, that's, that's the base, it, it, it starts right there. And, and once you realize that that is the main component that you need for, for hybrid learning, you can start to sort of feel your anxiety go down a little bit. Now, what, I, what will help with this is if you have your camera on your phone or on your, uh, on your computer in a position where the class can, uh, can also see students or if you have them projected in a way where, where the students can be seen, that helps to have the camera angled at a way for the online people to see the class. Those things help. So what you'll find is you can take a very basic setup and just by making some adjustments, you can, you can actually make the experience for the online students a little bit better. What we try to do when we set up hybrid learning in, um, at Mount Holyoke is we, everything that we did when we put a camera or a, a, a computer in a position is we looked at it through the lens of, if I was an online student, what would this look like to me? And, and those are the things that as you set up your classroom space, you're gonna to wanna to think about how are your, your students online going to be seeing the classroom? What's hard to see? Like, can they see the chart paper? Can they see the, the keynotes or the PowerPoint slides? Can they see the students who are in the back? And if they can't, are there adjustments that you can make so that they can see that? The, the idea here is that you're trying to make as much of the in-class uh, accessible to the online students. And, and so there's some creative ways that you can, you can broaden it. So if you just are going off your laptop, you, you're not gonna get a great zoom, but you can use a secondary device to actually capture more of your classroom. I'll show you how we do that in a second. Um, so, so this is it. Like if you, if, if you don't have a lot of technology at your school, don't feel like you can't pull off hybrid learning, you can. Um, and one of the things that makes hybrid learning dynamic, that's why I go with the dynamic model, is I like to have the, the shot, the, the camera shot that the students online are seeing to be dynamic. I want them to see things moving. I want them to see different, different um, parts of the classroom. And so some of the ways that you can do it, I'll show you one real quick hack that I found is um, buy one of these. Go to Big Lots or Best Buy or whatever, not Best Buy, um, like any Walmart or any place. These are those like lazy Susan things you can use for your, your closet organizers. They cost a couple of bucks. But imagine now, so like if you think about camera angles and stuff, if you're going off your laptop as your main device, I'm going to show you a sec something here. Let me just switch my camera angle for a bit. I'm going to go over to production shot here. So now you're going to see, um, I'm basically looking at the camera or the cameras behind me, but here we've got this lazy Susan. If I take my iPad, for instance, if I'm going to go off of this as my main camera, if you actually set your, your laptop or your, your, your iPad or whatever it is on this, you have a very easy way to basically get different camera angles without having to pick up your device. So this is like a simple $2 hack that you can do to now create uh, a nice easy way to take, like if right now it's facing the whole class and then maybe my chart paper's over here. So I spin it this way and now the camera's facing the chart paper. So with a simple twist like this uh, and a $2 piece of equipment, 
I can now make the experience a tiny bit better. And then I'm not worried as a, as a teacher about like having to invest in good cameras that move and pan and tilt and all that. That's great. But we all know what it's like in education. And uh, first of all, if, if you're lucky enough to have the, the budget to, to get this kind of equipment, cool. But if you, um, but even then you have to learn how to use it, right? So this keeps it fairly simple. Um, in all my experience that I found in education with uh, remote learning, the less technology we have to focus on as educators, the more our brain can focus on the lesson and the students. And ultimately that's what we're trying to do, right? We don't wanna bog ourselves down with uh, video production on top of teaching. So, um, so go ahead and play around with some of those things. Now, if you also, I'm just gonna show you a couple other things with this. Um, you don't have to just go with the basic elements. Um, one of the things that I would highly recommend to make it better. So when we went with our, our model, of, um, we still had that sort of online participant, in-class participants and the host. Um, but what we did is we still had that hosting computer that is running Zoom or Google Meet or whatever you want. But we did find that using a web camera that we could put on a tripod and use a remote control and move it to different parts of the room uh, made it easier. So the Lazy Susan's awesome. It's easy to do. Uh, but if you have a camera that can zoom in on people, then that's better. And you, again, you don't need something super fancy. So what you're seeing in the screen here, it's a little like this is about a $400 one that you see there. That's a little too expensive from what we uh, used when we first started doing hybrid learning at Mount Holyoke. We use $60 Logitech cameras. So it was a little ball on a stem. If you remember those, um, we use that for years and it worked fine. Um, the idea here is that you just want to make, uh, again, the classroom accessible for your online students. So that way um, you, you position everything in a way where they can see it. The other thing that I find is that you, if you don't have a camera that zooms and, and you're just going off your, your laptop, iPads or other kind of tablets that you can log into Zoom can serve as a secondary camera. So that iPad that I was showing you on that Lazy Susan, if I put that either, I mean, if you have a tripod, that's great, or just move it around from different parts in the classroom. Um, if you log that iPad into the Zoom room, you actually can switch to that camera. So you as the teacher, when you're operating in Zoom, you can spotlight any, any of the, uh, the, the videos. And so if you go ahead and take your iPad and face it toward your chart paper, for example. And so now instead of trying to lift your laptop and bring it all the way over to where the chart paper is, if you, have your, if you know you're gonna be teaching from the front of the room for part of the lesson, and then you're gonna go to the chart paper and, and work off of that, well then just position your iPad toward that chart paper. And then when you're gonna go move over there, as a teacher, you just go ahead and zoom, spotlight the iPad, walk over. Now the online students see the iPad um, image up close. So they're looking at that chart paper. Your in-class students are right there with you. So they see that. And so that's sort of the, the game you play. Um, I, like I think the best way to run hybrid learning is to have a device, a computer, whatever it is with a camera and an, an iPad or, or, or iPhone or whatever that can be that other piece. And you can jump between these two cameras and, and make the room more accessible. And it actually doesn't mean that you've got to set it up where you're anticipating every single transition. I'll tell my students, and we did this in, when we were doing uh, the initial stages of hybrid learning at Mount Holyoke. They'll say, all right, well, I'm going to move over to the chart paper now. So hang tight because I'm just going to carry this phone over here. It's going to jiggle a little bit it's totally fine. Like you don't need to make like these beautiful cuts from one camera to the next. Um, have fun with it. Just let them know it can be loose. Uh, your whole goal is to sort of bring that group of students along with you in the class. So don't perseverate over like the, the perfect camera angle or anything. So I just wanted to share those couple of tips. And then the last thing that's not really listed here uh, on this image here, but is really critically important. Uh, the number one piece of technology that you absolutely cannot compromise on is, is having a good microphone. Now, you don't need to spend a lot of money on a microphone, but you need what's known as an omnidirectional microphone. There's a lot of, lot of thoughts out there around hybrid learning. We've tried every different kind of microphone, and I'm telling you right now, 
all my years of experience, an omnidirectional microphone is absolutely the way to go. We have these little $60 jobs that we use and they pick up the entire classroom. Um, the reason you wanna use that, a lot of times people say, well, what if we get like a swivel and the teacher carries a swivel around? Um, the problem with the swivel is it's teacher centric. So unless you as a classroom teacher are the only one who speaks and you're, it's just, you're just gonna lecture, well then a swivel will work. But most teachers I know engage in dialogue with students. So there's a conversation. We want student voice. That's what makes the class engaging. And so if you're going to pull that off, you need a microphone that you don't have to hand off. So you can take a swivel and you can take it off and hand it to someone else and then they can wear it, right? But in COVID, right, you're going to have to start dealing with sanitizing that, right? So we got to get the wipes out and then we have to hand that off to someone. Then they use it. Then they sanitize it and hand it to someone else. You can avoid all of that by getting just that omnidirectional microphone placed in the classroom, and then anyone, no matter where they are, can be picked up. Uh, you just have to work on the microphone sensitivity and things, but that would be something if your school hasn't thought about that kind of equipment pur purchase right now, it should be on their radar. Feel free to email me, by the way, so if you need my contact information, like um, contact me any one of these ways, Twitter, uh, email, whatever you need. Uh, and I'll be happy to share the specs of some of the equipment I use. That way you don't have to like scramble and try to like remember what I said tonight. Um, go ahead, I'm happy to share the, the microphone recommendations, uh, iPad, um, tripod and stuff, recommendations and stuff. Happy to do it. So um, last thing I'm gonna show before I open up to some questions and things uh, is just sort of the, the general setup here. So what you're gonna notice on, uh, on this right now, I'm gonna just do a little, uh, uh, how we'll do this. I think um, easiest way will just do it John Madden style. So you're going to see this classroom set up here. And it's this is kind of a mock up of like how I'd set up my space right now. Uh, one of the things that I find really helpful in a hybrid space is, is to sort of set things up and it's not really illustrated here very well, but more of like a V style where like I have like the, the view here from the audience. So we've got sort of the audience who's in class can sort of see um, if you look at where these like blue lines are, um, they're sort of looking out into that like that like V area there. Um, and then the teacher positions him or herself sort of at the, the top of that, but also where the camera can also pick them up. And so what we're trying to do here is allow the teacher to be able to have eyes on the lens of the, the students so we can actually see the or the screen so we can see the students. We want the camera to be able to see uh, where the teacher is and to also be able to see the class. So that way uh, we can have a good position where we as a teacher aren't having to have our backs to anyone. One of the things that you want to avoid is addressing your in-person in students with your back to the camera or vice versa. Uh, if, you, or if, you, if there's a way, and I know it's tricky with social distancing, uh, but if there's a way, and I've been working in schools uh, last week, helping them orient the classroom to be able to accommodate that kind of camera angle. Um, that's honestly the ideal way because you as a teacher then don't have to worry about where you stand. Um, you, you've got this nice position where you can teach and see every one of your students and they can see you. And that is really important for this kind of work. Uh, one other thing you'll just notice is that I have this thing where it says HD camera in a screen, but it doesn't matter what the camera is. If you have a webcam, or if you're using your iPad as your, or your, your laptop as your main camera, it's critically important that wherever the online students are gonna be displayed, that the camera is also at that position. Uh, what we're trying is think about your eyesight camera right now where all of you are. You're looking at the screen where you see everyone's faces, but the camera's also right there so that it looks like you're making eye contact. Lots of times in hybrid settings, when people set these up, they have their camera in one area and their screen in the other. And what that ends up looking like is everyone's who's talking to people online are looking off in this weird direction and it's super impersonal. Uh, the hard part about hybrid learning uh, for teachers and for students is sort of that loss of community, that feeling of like we're one class. And so one of the things that we can do to make it better is to make eye contact by positioning the camera so that when the students in, in class are talking to their classmates online, it looks like they're looking at them and vice versa. Um, same with you as a teacher. So um, just those camera positions are, are helpful. And then you'll notice also in this little mock-up here is I have the iPad that's on a tripod 
And basically I can move it anywhere I want. I can take it and I can move it over to table six so they can watch what table six is doing. I could, I could put it right here in the front of the room and face it this way. So uh, students online can pin that video and look at classmates up close. There's, there's lots of flexibility um, and I would keep both of those on. And if you haven't used two devices at the same time with Zoom, just make sure you remember not to use the audio feature because you're going to have, uh, with that secondary device, you're going to get a terrible feedback loop. So that's a little bit on just sort of my setup. And this is kind of uh, what one of the spaces looks like um, at Mount Holyoke. This is one of our smaller class spaces. We do it in much larger spaces. But you'll notice in this, in this just this space right here, um, where we've got the camera. Let me go ahead and John Madden this again. So we've got the camera right here. Uh, this is the, so this spot right here, it looks like this is where students are. This is actually where I was teaching from. So these are my supplies and we would have students all along the perimeter here. So I don't know if a V, maybe a U is a better way of looking at it, like a semicircle. So you'll notice this setup where I'm teaching from this point. I've got the chart paper here, but the camera's got an angle this way. It's got an angle on all the different people who are in the room. And then we can all see the screen up at the top. So that's, kind of what you're, you're going for. With social distancing, you have to stack it. So you've got to bring the six feet. So you've got a, a row, like you're, that first part of the semicircle, they're six feet apart. And then you have six feet behind. So you can kind of play around with that. And then uh, you and your school have to figure out just how many kids can actually fit in that space safely um, with social distancing. But that's kind of what it's like. And then like, this is what it looks like with people in the room. So it's like, um, that's a, again, one of our smaller classes, we have more people online than, than, in, than in person for this particular class. So we could fit them in a smaller space, but that's basically the, 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 the um, initial setup for hybrid learning. And then the last tip I'll give before I open up for questions here is what people often are wondering is how do you engage online and in-person kids together? Because it's like, it feels like two separate audiences and it's really hard in the beginning. And my advice is for you to be the bridge between those two. So what's going to happen is typically neither audience is going to talk to each other. The online, and, the online students and the in-person students are rarely going to talk to each other in the beginning unless they know each other and there's some, some uh, a good classroom community that's been established. But it's a very weird setup for the first time for anybody, adults or kids. And so as a teacher, you're going to have to go back to those things that we talked about in my earlier session uh, this year around building class community of having uh, light lift activities to build conversation in that space. Now, what I found really helpful, even with adult learners, is that as the teacher, you're first, you'll find yourself doing a lot of the asking of questions, and it's going to be a lot of those one-to-one -one responses. So I'll ask a question of the online people. So I'll turn to the camera and say, All right, it, someone online, I'd love to hear what your estimate is for this problem. And then I'll wait and someone online will answer and I'll respond to them. And then I'll turn and I'll say, all right, so someone in person now, I'd love to hear someone in person talk about what might be a too high estimate for this task or something. So what I'm doing is I'm just doing straight up Q&A, uh, but I'm directing the attention to the online students and then I'm directing attention to the in-person students. And I try to fluctuate between the two. Now, the reason I start with something like that with a new group is because it's really easy and predictable. It means I, as a teacher, I'm, I'm carrying the heavy load. It's not a good conversation facilitation because um, it's a lot of that back and forth, teacher to student, teacher to student, student to teacher, not a lot of student to student conversation. But if you want to build this sort of trust in this space where kids are going to do that, you've got to start with that. Then the next move you do, once you've sort of gotten some kids talking and doing that that one-to-one -one response, is you do what's called the handoff. So then what I'll do is I'll say, all right, so someone online, I'd like to, I'd like someone to share what they think might be a good approach to solving this problem. And then someone will share that approach. And I'll say, I'd love to hear someone um, in person here. Um, can you add on to that? Or can you um, can you talk about why that is also a good strategy or, or what I'm doing is I'm taking that, that response from a student and then I'm, I'm asking a, a question related to that and then sending it to someone in the other space. And, and likewise, I'll do it with someone in person and then bring it up um, to someone online to respond to that. So that handoff 
is, um, is a way for you to pivot the conversation from going from a student to you back to the student, but instead it's a student to you and then you hand it to a student and you're sort of the, the conduit. You're the bridge between the, those two audiences. What you're trying to do is get those two audiences to gel and talk with one another. Third thing, once you've got that is you get yourself out of the conversation. So you tee up a question and say, all right, I'm going to ask a, a question about, um, you know, what, you know, for instance, let's do a light conversation. Like what is the absolute best book ever? Um, and then, so at what I what it might say is, all right, online, I'd love someone to share what they think might be one of the best books ever. And then I want someone in person to, to actually describe why someone might think that's the best book. And so what I'm doing there, so you get someone online who says that, and then I don't have to say anything because the next direction is someone in class has to say why that might be a good book choice or you know, something like that. So the idea is now I've taken away all that scaffolding. So I'm encouraging a student online to say something and a student in class to respond. These little steps, believe it or not, make a huge difference in helping to break down those barriers that kids have up. And, and so you'll find yourself over time having a backup and you don't have to, you don't have to occupy so much of the, the space because probably right now, even with remote learning, fully remote learning, it feels like you're a DJ on a radio show and you're just talking, um, especially if your students aren't putting their cameras on, um, you don't even know if they're there. So a lot of times it feels like you're talking to dead air. Um, these are ways that you can sort of build that. And, um, and of course, breakout rooms and getting groups to talk is uh, just another great idea. And if you're doing breakout rooms in a hybrid space, don't forget if you have that iPad logged into Zoom, uh, you also can do a hybrid breakout room. So send a couple of online kids to that iPad uh, and that iPad rather to the same breakout room and then have a couple of kids or one kid in class with social distancing, join them. And so you're building those connections with the kids who are in person and online. So uh, 30 minutes is not a ton of time. And I, I, I knew that hybrid learning is a newer uh, concept for a lot of folks. And um, typically with this session, if you're new to this session, uh, we usually sort of troubleshoot these things together. I made the executive decision this time, um, thinking that probably my experience with hybrid learning might be something that people would want to hear. So I, I know I used up a lot of our time today um, with me sort of explaining some of these quick tips. Um, I'm going to run a few more of these around hybrid learning uh, with other areas just to help get ourselves grounded in this work because I feel like a lot of people <clears throat> have an assumption that it's really easy or that it doesn't take a lot of work. Um, it really does. And I think the more we can support one another in this model, it'll help. So um, I don't have a hard stop at 930. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to hang out a little bit longer, but I'm going to open up the floor to Q&A and, and, um, and we'll go from there. And then um, I'll run a little bit, you know, past 930 if anyone wants to stay. If you, get, if you have a hard stop at 930, um, that's fine too. I appreciate your time and uh, we'll catch you next time. Uh, but let's go ahead and throw it in the chat or unmute your mic and uh, let me know what questions do you have about hybrid learning? Uh, how can I help you? I'm going to ask a question right out of the box, Mike, because I like the model that you use and it makes sense to me to Zoom and to synchronously teach your kids who are present and Zooming at the same time. But there's a lot of schools in our area. I'm an instructional coach. Our district is not going back in any time soon, but there are a lot of schools in our region who are talking about doing some sort of hybrid model where they're teaching the kids in the classroom one day and then they're teaching the kids at home another day. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because to me you're losing a lot of instructional time but i guess what kind of for my friends who are teachers in those districts what kind of things can they say to their administrators to to kind of wrap their brains around doing more of a synchronous type of thing because i think that is the right solution that's a great question and i think so a couple things one is I think administrators don't know what hybrid learning really is. I think that's one of the things that they, I think some people don't, if you haven't experienced it or you haven't seen like even just some of the slides of uh, sort of what we're doing at Mount Holyoke, it's hard for people to wrap their head around like teaching both groups of audiences. And so people think it's not possible. Um, what I like about it is like if, cause if they're teaching one lesson, and then the next day you're teaching the exact same thing to the other half of the class that's not in person. Uh, it, 
you're, it's redundant, right? So you're doubling up your efforts there um, where you could actually do both groups at the same time. Um, I'm going to share right now in the chat. So I wrote an article for ASCD about like what my hybrid learning model looks like. And, um, and so here we go. Uh, I'll drop it in the chat for you all. So this is a, uh, this is a, a description that you could share with administrators to help them see what it could be. Uh, go ahead and just share with anyone you want. But um, I tried to capture as much as I could of the hybrid learning model that would help people understand what this could look like. Um, and one of the things I do wanna say with regard to that too, is sometimes people, and I've been seeing a lot of this on Twitter, that people are saying that it feels like running two jobs because like, Teach, preparing for the online students and preparing for the in-class students feels like you're preparing two different sets of classes um, of work. And I, and I think I feel for folks that are, that are sort of in that sort of uh, <clears throat> pressure to kind of teach in that method um, because it can feel like two jobs. One of the things that I find is that if you design, if you design the space for just what you would do normally for remote learning and then you're you're, you are able to have students who are in person. Um, if your design is for online students, that's an easy pivot right to, to the person, people who are on campus or in, in class. And so it ends up reducing, I, I find it doesn't, in those instances, it's not doubling up a workload or feeling like you're working two jobs. Um, but what people need is good training to learn how to develop good workflow in that way. And I think that's the piece even with regular remote learning, I think there's just a lack of training. And so folks are just like, well, you know what it's like, I've taught for a number of years, everyone just sort of assumes we'll figure it out. And you know what, we always do. But I always think that's a detriment to our profession. I'll just a little soapbox moment here. But um, because so much gets dumped on us to figure out the problem. And we do because that's what we do as teachers. But think about if we if we can give teachers a good sense of how to work in this space and what's an efficient workflow so teachers aren't burning the candle at both ends and uh, and burning themselves out. So um, I would recommend again sharing this article, um, helping them get a vision for what that could be, um, and feel free to have them reach out to me if they want some clarification. I've just met with people just to chat on a quick Zoom call to help them understand what that could be to help them out. So feel free to send them my way too. Uh, other questions? I have a question. Yeah. How about um we are currently in a hybrid model and I'm finding it really hard to collect work for what kids are doing at home. It's hard to see unless it, you know, what they're doing and I want them to be accountable. So any suggestions on that? Now, Stacey, are you talking about like in the moment while they're working, it's hard to see them working because you've got students who are in class working on a problem or a piece of paper or whatever they're doing, but the ones online, you don't, you just see their faces and aren't able to see what they're doing? Correct. Okay. So in that moment, you know, usually I'm so on top of it, right? Like we, they've turned and talked that we've heard discussions. We've, we've been able to kind of lean in and kind of see what's going on, but I don't see their work. And even when I ask them, can you, you know, move your computer down so I can see, it's not always so easy just to, especially when it's more complicated math instruction to kind of see, what their work and their thinking. Yeah, I mean, so so a couple of things is is within, so if, if they're working off a paper, like the only way you're gonna be able to see that if they're at home right now, is just with the camera and perhaps a screenshot of it. So like angling the camera down, and we talked about it in one of our other sessions, I call it sort of like work mode where you, um, you take the camera or your, your you know, device or whatever and have it angled so you're, you're able to see the student's paper. But again, if they're working on some complex problems, they write small, it's in pencil, you're not getting a lot of that information because you can't, it's harder for you to see. So one of the things that you can also do if, if they're going off of paper is either ask them to screenshot their work in progress. So at any point you can say, all right, um, my online students, can you all just take a moment? <clears throat> I'd like you to screenshot your stuff where it is right now and drop it in my, my, Google, my student work folder in Google Drive or whatever uh, you have it. So what that allows you to do is if they take a, sh a screenshot of it, you see crystal clear, um, a crystal clear image of what 
the work in progress is. It takes a couple of minutes from their work time to do that, but it's giving you access to work in progress because then you could open up that Google Drive folder in the moment and scroll through for a second and realize like two students are actually doing this thing incorrectly. Um, so you might want to pull them into a small group and do some intervention. So uh, like feel free to do that. Um, or if they're working in something that's on, in a digital space, <clears throat> the other thing that you can do is enable uh, multiple kids to share their screens at the same time and then just ask all your students who are online to share their screen while they're working. So if they're working off a of Google slide or they're working off Desmos or whatever, wherever they are, um, just have them share off, um, share their screen. And then they can't see if they're sharing their screen, they can't see what other people are sharing, uh, but it allow you to just go through and you can actually click on any name and see what they're working on in the moment. And then you can do intervention that way. Uh, both of those kind of, um, you know, I found are, are pretty advantageous. Uh, Gene was saying, if you're worried about accountabilities, um, you could have them submit photo of the work after class too. Yeah, that's a great idea, Gene, is, uh, is yes, yeah, submitting work in progress, um, you, know, you know, at the end of the class. So, so that way um, you get a sense of what they accomplished during that period, whatever they were doing. Thank you very much. You're welcome. What else, folks? Can you hear me? I can. Yes, Jean. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry, I was working with microphone today. I have two questions. Okay. First of all, thank you for saying I only needed one or two devices because that relieves some stress. The first question is, will one microphone in the room work for the whole class and pick up everybody? Yeah. It, de well, it depends okay. on the microphone, right? Okay. But I can get so one. The one I, the one, like, I can't, I can never remember the name, but I want, to, I want to say DMX, but I'm like, I'm probably wrong on that. But uh, I'll, I'll, in two seconds, once I get up out of my seat, I can pull one up and show you it. That one, I, I just did a training uh, in Chicopee, Massachusetts in the staff workroom, which was massive. And uh, we had just one microphone. It picked up the entire room. I walked to the very back of the room with the microphone in the front and still talked to the people online so they could hear it. So yeah. Um, now, one quick funny thing with this, um, just so, and you'll appreciate this as teachers, because the microphones are that sensitive, everything that's said in that room is heard. And you, so one thing you have to let people know, <clears throat> your students, is that side conversations, everything you whisper, every little secret you want to tell is public. Um, and so uh, it's a great way to manage side conversations. It pretty much kills them. They don't happen anymore because everyone realizes if you turn and whisper something, then it's going to be picked up. And so it's helpful to know, but it's also helpful um, for people to know that those mics are also on all the time. I forgot to say this in the beginning. It's really important for all of you to get a piece of paper and write live on it or, or print something out, whatever you want to do for creatively and have a spot in the room where as soon as you set up your hybrid space and you turn your camera and your mic on, you hang that publicly so everybody sees it and 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 have everyone the basic protocol is if you're in my classroom the cameras are likely on and the micro microphones are likely on even if you've muted them you should always operate like they are because i'm telling you right now there's been so many instances where like people think there's no one in the room or no one online or something and they start talking about a student or whatever and it gets picked up avoid that at all costs so anyway that's it about this microphone sensitivity um what was your other question it might end up being three questions so the second part was you said having those two devices on zoom at the time how do you not get the audio problems with that great question so you start so if you start with your laptop login in join computer audio all that then when you log your uh, your secondary device in i first of all don't log into it don't like sign your name in because if you're the admin you want to keep the admin on your computer so then like like when i say log in like join the meeting is on your ipad and one of the prompts you get is join computer audio so just say no like disconnect that. So what will happen is that iPad will, you, the, there'll be no sound coming out of the speakers and the microphone won't be on. And, uh, and then that's perfect. It's just a camera at that point and you won't have any feedback. Um, when you go into breakout rooms though, so one thing I like to do, if, if we were gonna do like a hybrid breakout room, uh, when you send everyone off into breakout rooms, 
the iPad is actually going to get sent to a breakout room as well. So you actually could turn the microphone on and the speaker on during breakout rooms and have a student use it and talk with other online students during that time. You just have to remember when that I when the iPad comes back to the main meeting room, you got to make sure you've disconnected the audio before the before it gets back in the main meeting room, or you're going to get that feedback loop. Uh, third question. So even there is even though they're in the same room, you're not going to get problems. If they're in different breakout rooms? If they're in different okay. breakout rooms, yep. That, okay. The other big question is before tonight, I thought if I was doing hybrid, I was going to have every kid logged into Zoom and every kid like go into a breakout room with uh, somebody from distance, right? That's what I thought yeah. I was going to have to do. Yeah. And one, should I even try to pursue that or I can just let that go? Let it go. Yeah. Here's why. Here, I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. One. Okay. Thank you. If you all try to do that, so let's say everyone comes with their device and they all log into Zoom and then you want to just match them up. Um, well, first of all, why have them in class anyway, right? So if they're just, if they're in person and they're on Zoom, why not just let them stay home and be on Zoom? Um, second, the feedback. Um, so even if they're in breakout rooms, if they're all like, they're, you're not going to get that like chirpy feedback that you get when you're in the same space. But what you're going to, um, like if I'm in a breakout room right now, Everyone else's breakout rooms, I'm going to hear all the speakers and stuff and all that noise is going to come through. It, it's really hard for anybody to hear in that. So it doesn't work. And the third thing is, if you have kids who are in person and you have kids who are online, if the kids who are in person also log into Zoom, well, now that Brady Bunch gets really big. And so those kids who are online that you want to see nice and clear, you're not going to see much of them because you're going to see Jonathan twice. He's in person and he's on the screen. And so I like to keep the in-person people in, pe in person and let the class camera pick them up. And, um, and I like the online students to have their space. It's, um, they're already at a disadvantage from having to learn at home. So let's give them the advantage of have, being more visible if they turn their cameras on, right? Depending on, I, I, I'm, I'm hearing it's, it's working well at the elementary level, middle school and high school, not so much. But, um, but anyway, like that would be the, um, the way I would approach it. And the reason why too is like, if you're in class, granted, you can't work right alongside people, but six feet apart, you can still have small group conversation with people. I want, you want those human connections, right? Kids need it. If, if, this, if it's safe for you to be back socially distanced in a hybrid model, maintain human relationships as much as possible. We've been on screen so much take advantage of the time to have some FaceTime. Um, with that being said, if you have some kids who are never going to be in class, make sure that they can rotate in with, a, with one hybrid breakout room, just so there's a better connection. That's how relationships are formed in the small groups, not in the whole group as much. So um, it's, you want to make sure kids get a chance to work with one another that way. Mike, uh, this is, yeah. can you hear me? I can hear you, Nancy. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Could you, um, restate the, the brand or the type of microphone you recommended at the beginning of the session? I, I couldn't remember. I'm going to grab it right now. Give me one second as I try not to trip over all my cables. Hang on one second here. All right, there we go. I think I said DMX. I was one, I only have one letter, right? It's MXL. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's called a pro MXL. Uh, M is in Michael X is in X <laughs> and L is in lion, I guess. Uh, and it's called the Procon series one. And then I don't know if this means anything here, but it says AC uh, 404 USB. I think that just means the power and the, it's a USB connection. Um, that's it. It's this little guy sits right on top of a desk or a floor and everything and uh, super powerful. Like this picks up an entire classroom uh, really well. If you have a major space and you, you needed a second one, you can hook up two of them um, and just spread them out. And um, you just have to play with a level so you don't get a feedback loop um, in there. But but pretty much that's it. Yeah. So Thank there you. we go. You're welcome. All right. Got time for one more question. Anyone want it? I, I will take that. It All may right. be off topic a little bit, but um, I have been trying to um, attend as many hybrid sessions, informational um, 
uh, meetups as I can. Um, our teachers are, um, I'm a content specialist here and um, the teachers are working very hard. And, um, you know, we have been talking to them all the time about having student centered, you know, math classrooms and let the children read, lead those discussions and ask them those questions. And, and now I feel my, our teachers are regressing back to that, you know, I'm going to lecture, I'm going to talk and the students are going to listen. I don't blame them because it has been a terrible ask of them to jump into this with no training. Um, what do you have any advice on how I can, I'm going to provide them with examples, especially of what you shared tonight, but is there any other words of wisdom? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a good question, right? Like if, if I wish I could just like give a couple of sentences and this, it would fix all like lecturing. Yes. Um, right. But, um, but we have to, so here's one thing I'll say is teachers who are reverting back to lecture is it's a survival mechanism. Right. And it's a, so to me, it's a symptom of an underlying problem of a system and this, when I say system, I'm not meaning just district. It could be like the global education system, right? Um, a system failing to take care of its educators, right? And so, because um, we have really good teachers who are reverting back to lecture didactic teaching right now because they're barely hanging on. And so what my first words of wisdom would be, check in with them and see how they're doing. Like try try to break through that tough exterior that we all would put up, you know, as teachers, like, well, we got it. We're fine. We're totally good. We can. And meanwhile, we're barely hanging on. Um, if we can, I think that's the first place we got to work is like, in, and I, I say that because it's easy to like, especially in, in instructional coaching roles, we want to continually support and it's, and, um, but by helping instruction to get better. But I think the, the way we do that is we first make sure that they're okay. If they're okay and they're choosing to do this because they're thinking maybe this is just the best way to go with online instruction. Because sometimes people will also choose a didactic approach because it feels like, well, webinars are kind of it, right? You just kind of tell people that's the nature of online learning. Because if that's all they've experienced for online learning is a webinar, remember how when we were all pre service teachers, you teach the way you were taught till you learn better. Uh, well, if your only experience with online learning is webinars, well, then you're going to, you're basically going to be a webinar seventh grade teacher. And, uh, and that's not helpful. So what we can do is if there's ways that you can give people um, opportunities to see good interactive online learning. So um, I don't know if you've seen any of my, like, like the videos and stuff I made when uh, COVID first hit and stuff, but those videos actually have us like working on like this serial problem. And we're, we're uh, so if you show people just a small clip of that, of like how these adults from around the world engaged in this problem and how like you can actually have conversation and things, um, those examples help people realize that there's some other possibilities out there or better yet, take that task that you saw me do in a video and uh, you have access to the slides and all that. And if you need more access to it, just let me know and I'll give it to you and then lead it yourself. Like, like facilitate that with them so they can experience it as a learner too. And those moments when they, they experience it from the other side helps them realize that it's possible to do something other than lecture. Uh, but again, start by just making sure they're okay. Cause that's, um, I worry about our teachers. So, all right. So that's, uh, you're welcome. That's it. Well, thanks folks. Like I said, I like, there's so much demand for hybrid. I may run, I know we've got this sort of, we got another one coming up in November. I may, I was talking to Tracy Zager. I may, I, I may run a bigger one, like to really get into the hybrid stuff. And I might try to do it in a hybrid format, like get some folks in person and stuff. Uh, I'm working on some of the logistics right now to pull that off, but I um, keep, I'll, I'll, you're on the email list. So I'll just keep you abreast of that. Um, be a, a super, uh, um, you know, interesting event to kind of do hybrid learning in the hybrid learning space uh, just to help people see that. So um, if I end up doing that, feel free to spread the word and, uh, you know, just you know, like to support people as much as possible. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. Good luck, everyone. And I'll see you next time.